Hi, welcome to The Stitch TV Show. I'm Lynn. And I'm Pam. We're happy you're joining us today. The Stitch is an online quilt talk show, the perfect soundtrack for your sewing room. In addition to our talk shows, we also post tutorial videos, virtual stitch-ins, and book clubs. You can learn more at thestitchtvshow.com. Our show today is brought to you by our friends at InMart and QT Fabrics. You can learn more about them and the links in our show notes. So, um, I'm very excited. We have the table runner so you can see more of the fabric from the Radiance line by Dan Morris right. for QT. Yes. And I'll be real honest with you. Pink has never been one of my top favorite colors. I know. But this is really attractive. And I think it's just because it has so much depth and, you know, it brings in other, other colors that I don't think people think go with pink. So I think everything goes with pink. I don't, well, yeah, it does, but. Called her out on some color theory right there. No, she's right. It does. <laughs> but uh, I, I will tell you, pink for me has been one of the harder ones to work with because it's not been my favorite yeah. color. Just like I think, I know my favorite color is orange, but a lot of people say that about orange. That they, it's not their favorite, so it's harder to work with. Yeah. So pink for me. But I think this would be an easy pink to work with. And I've made friends with pink, just so you know. Well, and I love that. I know. The thread Look at goes and Mark's with it thread too. goes right with that. What is this called? That is the Since color. you don't get to name this. This is the iris. Isn't it iris color? Bright, Bright tulip. tulip. Oh, it's sunflower. Sorry. This is why. Iris do. is the brand. Yeah, iris is the brand. Too. I did try to name one of their other tulip yes. colors. And this is um, not, a, not, not quite so much a winner. This is a poly cord. Yeah, it's a cotton wrapped poly cord. Yep. Yeah, mint so it's stronger yeah. because it's poly in the center and then wrapped with cotton. Yeah, so if you don't want the sheen like you would get from a polyester, this I is a I haven't tried option. this yet, so I'm gonna I'm going to uh, get one of the. I've oh. tried the poly and the other one, but I was gonna get this and uh, maybe use it on some things. The problem is I've been doing a big project and still working on it. Still working on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna talk about that in just yeah. a minute. But before that, what are we talking about today? So today we're going to be talking about scrappy quilts, which are a lot of people's favorite, and machine embroidery. We're joined by our newest pattern, Keys to My Heart. This pattern it has instructions for three different sizes, <gasps> baby lap and queen, and you can find it at shop.thestitchtvshow.com. Yeah, what's hanging behind us is the baby size. And uh, so, uh, gosh, what are we what are we doing lately here, quilt, <laughs> Lynn? It's just all all the quilting. Good news, all we we learned what officially got accepted to our guild show. Yeah, so I, I didn't have to keep the secret anymore. Thank God, that was hard. Just so I, it wasn't hard for like the most of the people. It was hard keeping a secret from you. Yes, because uh, you know she would say stuff. I don't know if this got in the show, and I was like. You got in the show. <laughs> Shh. It's a whole good news, bad news situation. Good news, guys. So she was complaining the whole time she's complaining. I knew he'd gotten in the show just FYI. Yeah. It's all I was like, I'm not telling you. Yeah. Good news. So it's like good news, bad news, good news. Like it's going to come back around. Like good news. We got in the show. All four quilts that I submitted were accepted. Yes. Bad news. And I knew that. At that time, only two of them were finished. <laughs> Good news. Good news. I've finished one of them since. You'll see it in the next show. And the fourth quilt, like, the end is in sight. I'm on the last part of the quilting. So, yeah. <laughs> so It's a real roller coaster, guys. For me, and I knew the whole time, but one of mine got accepted in the show, and it's the one that wasn't done. And it's the one that is requiring tons of quilting on because— It's whole cloth. It's whole cloth. And um, good news, the piecing is done. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it got in on its piecing. Um, uh, the picture was a piece of fabric. It had drawing on it. Did. It had lots of drawing on it. It did. So, um, <laughs> we have some liberal acceptance guidelines. Yeah. No, we do not. No, yeah, that's so true. We don't. don't. No, we don't. Yeah. Well, um, like if you were just some Yahoo off the street that submitted that, they would be like, mm, no. But they've seen your work before. I they think know, that, yeah, that's good. I think that that might. They could see the Instagrams. Know. You've been showing have, pictures along yeah, the way. So, but needless to say, I have gone from this, the worst idea I've ever had last time we talked, to it's still a really bad idea. <laughs> But I'm beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Like, it's starting 
to come together and um it's an Alice in Wonderland quilt. So the, the caterpillar's done, Alice is done. I'm working on the mushrooms and foliage in the back and um, some flowers. So I just have micro stippling left on mine. And all the butterflies. All micro micro stippling, I think I could do in my sleep. Right. That's why it's Okay, here's how much quilting I've been doing, seriously. Yesterday I had to stop after three hours because my wrist got so sore because I was doing such tiny work. And I went online and ordered a wrist brace. Like, I'm like, I... Oh, you should have told me. I have, like, three. Oh. <laughs> I could have barked like It'll one. be here tomorrow. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but I was like, I need to really just protect this yeah. because I know that I've got a long way to go on it and I can't stop. Um, so I just took some ibuprofen and rested it a little bit, and I feel it feels fine today, but I could just tell it was getting tender. And I was like, I just need to walk away for a little. I need to step yeah. back. And But I've been doing serious amount of quilting, so and it's crazy. So, Pam, what is scrappy? I think what's hanging behind <laughs> us is scrappy. I agree. Well, I think, you know, at the basic definition like Webster says like I have no idea what Webster says I didn't look it up you didn't no because it's in my head scrappy is when you throw together all different kinds of fabrics together in the same quilt project and sometimes that means three fabrics sometimes that means a bajillion fabrics okay and there's obviously a range of scrappiness like this is a whole lot of different fabrics in the same colorway I should say to me this is this is not scrappy. I mean, it's controlled scrappy. It's, it's controlled not, scrappy. Then I would agree with that. Yeah, like it's planned. Full even. on wild scrappy. All you're doing is having all the different colors that are light and all the different colors that are dark, and then maybe there's some different colors that are classified as medium. See, and all your darks could be like black, dark blue, dark red, brown, green, like any of those colors. And it's differentiated by value. Too. See, I still think that that's not scrappy. I think scrappy is whatever. Doesn't matter. You're not You're just saying scrappy means it's a quilt. It's No, I'm saying scrappy means you're pulling whatever out of your scrap bin, not determining light, medium, and dark, not determining color, not determining print style or style of fabric. It's just whatever. I feel like with that interpretation, that is why you don't do scrappy quilts. Well, no. <laughs> because I'm just saying at the at its at its base form, that is a scrappy quilt. Without any determination whatsoever. At its base form, that's a scrappy quilt. Because the reason I say that is historically <laughs> I've seen scrappy quilts that just are fabric. It's not, there's no plan of light and dark. There's no plan of, you know, value or anything like, it's just. It's just, I got to be warm. I got to be warm and I'm putting, <laughs> I'm putting scraps of fabric together in, you know, squares or half square triangles or whatever. So I think at its base form, I think you're the I next. I think in a historic form, yes. Well, no, no. I'm just saying in its base form, that's a scrappy quilt. And then you say, okay, I don't like that look. So now I'm going to take it to the next level and say light, medium, dark, and these are darks and these are lights. And then I think, yeah, that's still a scrappy quilt. You're just putting another rule around it. So do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. I still think you're wrong, but yeah, I mean. <laughs> or maybe not that you're wrong. I think you are historically accurate, but that is not a style that resonates She's with me. She's just going to throw me a bone. <laughs> yeah, you're cute. <laughs> Your little quilt history, study. That's <laughs> cute. <laughs> I don't think, I, I mean, I will say that I've seen them historically. Like, I'm not going to deny will, those exist. Like They, they totally they, exist, yeah. Yeah, they exist. And I think they exist today, too, not yeah. just historically. I think that you... Say, okay, that's not a style I like, even though in its base interpretation, that's what a scrappy quilt is. I like this, and how I define it or look at scrappy quilts are. And elevate them to the next form of design is saying, okay, there's value, and there's light, medium, and dark. And So when you make a scrappy quilt, because she makes a ton more than I do. And I would say when I make a scrappy quilt, everything about it's planned. <laughs> so there's very little scrappy to it from the standpoint of 
like I think I make very what you are perceived to be scrappy quilts, but I've planned them out. <laughs> So is it scrappy at that point? Yeah, because you're still mixing colors together. The scrappiness is about the composition of the fabric, not about the process you go through to choose them. Ooh. Science. <laughs> or something. <laughs> Look at me having a brilliant thought. <laughs> no, that Saturday was Saturday morning. I haven't finished my coffee yet, guys. It's going great. <laughs> I need more tea. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, okay. Then I can agree with that. Good. So the segment's done. And we're, and good. we're good. Thanks for playing. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, okay, so you make a ton of scrappy quilts. When you make these scrappy quilts, what what is your process? The oh, vitamin, light, medium, well, dark, and by color? Eh. Or what process do you go through? I mean, some are definitely more successful than others. <laughs> <laughs> this one's successful. Really successful. I mean, I yes, loved it. When, there are when she first showed me this, moments of success. however long ago it was. Cause there are some squares that I look at that I'm like, oh, I should have chose a slightly lighter scrap for that piece. The peak of the orange heart, like where they come together, like that gray square needs to be lighter to have good contrast. Or I should have turned the fabric over so the backside would be lighter. Which you can do, by Which the way. Which you can do. There, that does happen. It happened. it happened in a show quilt, the one that I'm still finishing. Where I was like, I need a cream because it's too dark. On purpose or by cream. accident? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, and. Yes, both. Sometimes it's like, well, I guess I'm going to live with that. And sometimes it's like, oh, yeah, that's, that needs to be turned over. Okay. So you plan it by color. Like, this is planned by color. This is definitely planned by color. Right. And this one was specifically planned by the size scraps that I keep. See, that's where we are very different. Oh, yeah. I don't keep size scraps, so one of my... She tried to do it once. I oh, came yeah. over, and we, like, had a cutting party. <laughs> and I was like, I could turn this into a consulting job. And then and then we're like, oh, no, this doesn't work for Lynn at all, because that's not I the kind. That's it. not how you make quilts. Yeah. And honestly, I rarely use the ones that we cut. Like, I pull them out for a color class. Yeah, which is which fine. Which is good. But I don't sew them, which is bad. So you know, because it's all that fabric. So there's a couple quilts that I have in process now that right. I think makes sense. Just two? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Just okay. two. I mean, there's a third that's one that's applique that doesn't play into this discussion. That's unusual. She just has two in process is what I was Actually, it's about. not. I think you I do more than two. I tend to do like two. one through all the way. Anyway. Well, anyway. So I'm doing a baby quilt, and the requirements were we would like it to be Navy, white, and gray. Or oh. blue, white, and gray, but stay away from baby blue, even though it's a baby quilt. By the way, I have to do two baby quilts now. Well, girl, that's on you. I know, but you're going to help me with them. No. Mm. Yes. Mm. Mm. I know some good patterns you can use. I know. Those were the ones I was hoping we would it's use. Right. It's written up. <laughs> that's it's good to go. <laughs> there's lots of small... Okay, go ahead. Because I'm going to tell you why I don't do your scrappy quilts. So, I have this requirement of, like... Blue, gray, white. Uh -huh. So I know, like, okay, cool. I'll find a pattern that I know will work, and I know that the white will have contrast. I'm going to have that be my constant. Right. And then I'm going to mix in the grays and the blues, and I know to stay away from super light baby blue, which makes sense, because from a value standpoint, I want to do that anyway. Right. But I was also told, like, add in additional colors that you think would enhance the design as you will. Cool. So I'm adding in a little bit of yellow. Oh, I like that. Yeah, I like that. Now... This is an entirely scrappy piece top, and I'm thinking it would benefit from a little design element or focus. And so I want to do some applique on it. And I don't, we don't know oh, the baby's name yet or anything. Right. So can't do like a monogram or, you know, anything like that. So I got to come up with <gasps> some element. I know. I just can't. You know, they're not Southern. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> I can deal. You could just, just take a deep breath. We're going to talk about embroidery next segment. Yeah. Whew, girl, Whew. getting ready. Save it for that. Okay. I'm going to loosen so, up. So now I'm thinking of like applique element that works with these colors and speaks to a mix of blue, yellow, gray, and white. And I'm like, oh, a sun. Oh, yeah. That would be pretty. Yeah. That would be perfect. So in pulling out fabric for that, I went to like, what are the scraps I already have cut? And started pulling in anything that was a medium to dark gray, a medium to dark blue. So I would have contrast with that white element in there. Right. 
So that's a controlled scrappy where I know like these four colors and like I don't have super pale yellow in there either. I have like a richer, darker yellow, kind of like what we've got on the table here. Yeah, real sunny. Yeah, very bright sunny. Bright yellow. Now the other... Yellow's hard to... I have all the colors. Yellow's one of the hardest ones to work yeah. with. Because it'll get brown really quick. Oh, yeah. If you yeah, go, I didn't want brown. If you want a dark yellow or a, in value, you know, It a turns dark, like goldy brownish. Oh, yeah, it does really quick. So the other scrap quilt that I have in progress is one where I... Um, it actually featured in our National Color... Or National Quilting Day Color Lecture. Those blocks that I used for that are part of this other scrappy quilt. It's been so long ago. I know. I don't remember what We'll have blocks. a link to that in the show notes if okay. you guys want to go see it. Yes. Um, but the sample blocks that I made from that are playing in, and it is... I had started off saying, like, I'm just going to do a simple pink and white scrappy quilt. Right. And then it started to look flat, where I was just doing 12-inch blocks of random designs. And it just started to look very flat. It needed some additional depth. And so when we swapped fabrics for this color lecture, it was a perfect opportunity to start bringing in some, some more depth in terms of a purple and a green. Now, not as prevalent as the pink in terms of the percentage of each within the design, but enough to give it some depth and some interest of like, oh, I'm going to look here purple and I'm going to look here there's green. And, you know, so your eye has a plan to travel around the quilt because otherwise it would have just been uh, pink clown vomit. <laughs> That's how it was looking. <laughs> pink clown vomit. Which is... That's, that's exactly the visual I needed. Like the clown ate a lot of cotton candy, got yeah. too excited at the circus, <clears throat> and bloop. <laughs> So, when I think of scrappiness, <laughs> it's trying to avoid the whole clown vomit phenomenon. It needs to have a little more structure, and that's when I start bringing in the value right. difference. And, right. you know, I've done scrappy trip around the world blocks, and there's uh, Bonnie Hunter has a great tutorial on her website that we'll link to. And, you know, I, that's how I cut some of my scraps of like, well, I just two and a half inch strips at this length. And, and so I am like kind of just randomly pulling strips and sometimes I'm like, well, let me make sure I'm doing light, dark, light. Sometimes it's like, nope, all the colors, just put all the colors just in. Just pull them out of the bag. Just pull them out. Well, it's a very... Skinny thing. It's a very whatever. chic, organized it's strip organized. holder. It's way organized. Um, but yeah. Okay, here's the reason I don't do scrappy quilts. Because you have to have everything pre-cut to mm -hmm. really do them. And I don't. Yeah, otherwise it's, so, yeah. So my approach, so I don't think I do scrappy quilts in the same way you do. I do do quilts that have lots of different fabrics in them. And I approach it by the block and with a set of rules. And we've already talked about, you know, I know we don't have quilt rules. But when I, when I make a quilt, I make rules for myself to stay within that box and see how I, creative I can be within that space. So, like, and we've talked about this before, but the New York Beauty that I'm working on, every New York Beauty block has to have red, green, I'm not, sorry, not red, orange, green, and purple in it. And so it's like, okay, what fabrics can I put together that make this? And that is scrappy to me, mm -hmm. you know. So I think I just approach scrappy differently yeah. than you do. I just, that's why I think all of mine are very controlled. Yeah, well, I'm always coming, I... Well, do I have another one? Yeah, I actually have a different one that's in process. You were right. I have a third one that's scrappy in process. Um, what That I was looking at my stash, because, again, I cut up scraps at the end of a project and just stick them in. So my scrap sizes that I have on hand are 2-inch squares, 3.5-inch, 5-inch squares, and 10-inch squares. And my, my pile of 3.5-inch cools, so like the greens, the purples, the blues, as one would expect, because those are colors I tend to use more, was yeah. like bananas overflowing. So you just decided you needed to make a quilt so because I was like, it was bananas overflowing. I'm like, this is getting out of hand, and I'm running out of room, and so I, I got to make a quilt with them. I just, anything that's left over, if I can't rewrap it on a yeah. comic book backer board and put it on my shelf, which I will, um, I put it in a bag. Yeah, but then it gets crinkled, and then you got to press it, and I ain't got time for extra pressing. No. Yep, that's true. I do. But there's a, a lot of great scrap quilt books out there, so I pulled one out um, from Diane Knott, who's actually local to us here. Yes. Um, and she had a great pattern that used three-and-a-half-inch scraps. <laughs> yes. So, and I was like, 
Oh, and I, I didn't want to do like the 90 inch size that she had for the finish. So I just did a little math. I'm like, all right, I only need X number of this blocks. So I'm like, oh good, I only need like 427 three and a half inch squares. See, this is right there. That's <laughs> or how, whatever the that's number was. Because there's like cutting lots of pieces. Well, so. but I didn't have to cut because good news, I had at least 370 three and a half inch squares in this color family that worked well together. And the benefit <laughs> is when be it's crazy. scrappy, like you could throw in some wackiness. Like there's some Christmas fabrics. That, I started to say that was my next question. In there. And so they just kind of blend in with like. If you look at some of these scrappy quilts historically, they didn't have the novelty kind of thematic. Yeah, like all I mean, the they did, but not to the plethora that we have oh, yeah. today. And that's what I struggle with is like, how do I how do I hide this like wacky novelty in oh, some quilts? And see, that's the New York beauty I'm working on. That's exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm trying to put all the novelty that I can get in there to prove that you can use novelty in a quilt that doesn't look juvenile. Yeah. And it doesn't. I mean, I got some kittens singing the 12 days of Christmas. I got Buddha bunnies. You would need a quilt with Buddha bunnies. <laughs> What's a Buddha bunny? You know, it's little bunnies sitting in like a Buddha. Oh, gotcha. I was not thinking of like the deity. I was thinking it was like some weird brand. No. No. They, they're they sitting in like a Buddha style, like, you know. Crisscross applesauce. I have no idea what that is. Oh, that's the politically correct term for what we used to call Indian style in grade school. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Crisscross applesauce. Yes, with their legs. With yeah, their, their bunny, ankles crossed. Their bunny feet cross. You can't really see it because it's got like the kimono over it. Anyway, I will show you. You know what? We're going to have a picture on screen. We're going to have a picture on screen of the that. Buddha bunnies. Of the Buddha bunnies. Maybe they're not Buddha bunnies. Maybe they're just Japanese bunnies. Maybe. Because they're kind of got that. Um, There's some very Zen bunnies. Are they meditating? It, well, their eyes are open, so I'm not going to say they are. No, I will say so. Having recent experience with meditation, you start with your eyes open, then you close them eventually. So maybe they're getting into it. Okay. Well, I don't know. They're anyway. both sitting there. We've gotten away with from this. Yes, discussion. I don't know. Anyway, so what I was my point was here was my original point that when you do plan scrappiness, which is I think kind of the style that we see a lot of quilts mm -hmm. that are scrappy quilts go to, especially in the modern world, um, that sometimes it helps to stay in a specific uh, type of fabric only if you want that look. Like wovens or prints or batiks or yeah. 30s or... Yeah, 1800s reproduction scrappy quilts have a very different look than a 1930s reproduction scrappy quilt. So if you're wanting to have a certain look, you would stay with a certain style of fabric. Batik scrappy quilt's going to be different than a... This is, to me, all over a scrappy quilt. Yeah. I don't know if you have batiks in there. I don't see any. Yes, I do. Yeah, there's a couple little ones. Yeah. Um, but they tend to read as solids. Or, yeah. Yeah. So, but that didn't overwhelm it. Right. You know what I'm saying? So if you're using mostly batiks, then you would have. So th I would just say, when you're doing a scrappy quilt, just pick out your favorites and mm -hmm. go with that. Yeah. And, you know, and if you want to do thematically, you know, you're going to stick to certain colors. Like if you want a bunny quilt, you're going to throw all the bunny fabrics in there. Or if you want a Christmas quilt, it's going to have a certain red and green feel to it. Or, you know, a Halloween quilt or a baby quilt or whatever kind of thing. So, yeah. I like scrappy quilts. I like doing my style of scrappy, which I think is very different than your style. But I think they both work. And it's we we approach it differently. Yeah. Well, and the beauty of it is, um, you don't have to like my quilts, and I don't have to like your quilts. But I think, in generally, we do when we respect the process. And oh yeah, and that, yeah. I'm like, I do like your quilts. What are you talking about? I like this I'm one saying, a lot. Like you're allowed to make the kind of quilts that you want to make, and that that's if true. someone comes yes. at you and says that's not scrappy, tell them to take a hike. Yeah. Go, go kick some rocks. It's my scrappy. Well, yeah, and just because you don't approach scrappy, if you do scrappy like I do scrappy, which doesn't feel like it's... Scrappy? Scrappy. <laughs> it's more control. I feel like we're saying scrappy a lot. Yeah, we are. We're pretty scrappy uh, <laughs> about it. We're scrappy about being scrappy. Scrappy-dappy-doo. <laughs> anyway, 
I just think that it's okay, you know, like not everybody approaches the quilt process the same way. So uh, you don't have to cut all the squares. I'm okay. You're okay. It's all We're okay. all okay. All right. So anything else on that one? Nope. <laughs> okay, good. Now we're going to take a closer look at Keys to My Heart and we'll be right back. Welcome back. So now we're going to talk about machine embroidery. You're going to talk about machine embroidery, and I'm going to sit here and sip my water because <laughs> I got nothing. I, I don't. I don't do it. Well, uh, yeah, I I know you don't have a machine embroidery machine. <laughs> yes. That being said, um, y even if you don't have a pre-programmed <laughs> machine embroidery machine, yes. you can do machine embroidery. You can. Um, okay. With a zigzag stitch. Okay. And free motion. You okay. can do machine embroidery. And there's videos online on how to do this with just a regular sewing machine. Do you have a link that we could put in the I, notes for people? I could find one. Okay, we'll do that. So I will find one. Um, and the reason I know you can do this, there's a couple of reasons. One, my mother-in-law used to have a machine embroidery business and she taught herself how to machine embroidery in the 80s on a regular sewing machine and actually would do big patches on the backs of, you know, jackets and do letter monograms or names for uniforms and stuff. So it can be done, even though that's not when we all think of that. We think of these machines that we bought. The computerized. The computerized world. $11 billion. Exactly. And... We do all that. So I just didn't want to anybody to think that it, they can't do it with their own machine. They totally can. And these are machines, and I'm talking about machines that just do a straight stitch or a zigzag is really all you need to be able to do machine embroidery. Um, I think technically a lot of people would call it thread painting today. Um, it's just how dense it is, um, but it can be done, just so you know. All right. You could do it. It's probably I've, not something you would do. But Well, I've done thread sketching when you yeah. talk about our table runner pattern time after right. time. There's a, a winter scene that is... It just looks like, oh, I used really contrasting thread as I was free motion quilting. Right. Poof. Now it looks like embroidery. Poof. So what I was going to say is even though if you don't have a, a, t a machine embroidery machine that does it, that you put in a hoop and everything. And, uh, you know, a lot of people do have those machines and do use them. And they are super fun. And I do have one. Um, the key to machine embroidery, I would say the most important thing about machine embroidery is the hoop. Um, and this one is for, um, I have a baby lock sewing machine that does embroidery. And this this attachment goes into the arm of the baby lock. And then this is what moves it to create the, the design. Um, and then there are different size hoops for different size needs. Now, you, if you were doing machine embroidery on your own sewing machine that doesn't have the embroidery attachment, you would just use a um, em old wooden embroidery hoop. Probably like a six inch, maybe? Yeah, six, seven inch is very common for what you would use. And it would be used for like, you know, thread painting. But the key to embroidery um, is stabilizer. Uh, you really need to stabilize your work. And that keeps the stitches from sucking in on the fabric. Yeah, it keeps the tension even across the field. Right. And there's lots of different stabilizers, and I just want to talk about a couple of them. But the two main kind are tear away and, and cut away. Or dissolvable. Well, dissolvable is another kind. The two and there's three kinds. Well, right, but... <laughs> Dissolvable is for certain patterns, though, gotcha. that you're not going to do just any pattern on. Okay. So I kind of put it in a different category gotcha. from that standpoint. And 
the other reason dissolvable is used is in addition to this. Okay. So like um, tear away is if you have a non-stretchy fabric. Okay. Like a cotton. regular old cotton quilting. Cotton quilting, that's tear away. Because when you tear it away from your stitches, this is tear away. And it's a, this one's heavy. They come in medium and light also. But what tear away is, is if it doesn't have any stretch to it, use tear away. And that means when you tear it away from the back, then it will not pull on the stitches because the, the fabric doesn't stretch. And that's the kind of stabilizer, like if you buy an embroidered shirt or something at the store. If it's cotton. If it's cotton. Like it's cotton. On embroidered hats, I think. Yes. You see this was, kind of lot. Yes. When you're like, oh, my company's logo and name right. was on the hat, and I flip right. it over, and I'm like, oh, there's this weird white stuff in the middle of the That's A. That's stabilizer. Stabilizer. Yeah. So the other kind is, um, this is cutaway. This is a fusible mesh, but it's a cutaway stabilizer, and that is what you use for stretchy material. So anytime you see any kind of shirt that's got a little, like golf shirts that have t-shirts -shirt, that have like a, you know, a give to them or that are stretchy, then you use cutaway because cutaway, you don't want to pull against that because the, the threads will stretch with the material that then will either rip the material or break the threads, depending upon the thing. So, all right, so that's cut away and tear away, and those are why you use those two different kind. All right, the next one that you see is water-soluble, okay? And water-soluble stabilizer is, um, you would use in addition to one of these, like if you are doing towels, mm -hmm that have a high um, loft. loft to them. You would put this, you would put your stabilizer on bottom, then you would put your towel, and then you would put this water-soluble stabilizer on top, and that allows it to um, sew on top of that high loft without matting down the other loft around it so you're, it will embroider it correctly. Okay. So it, it prevents the loft from being taking, um, sticking out in between the threads. This kind of mashes it all down at one time so the threads can lay down evenly. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. And see, honestly, you could do this with your home sewing machine because you would just be doing a zigzag over this loft and you would still stabilize it. You can still do all this on your home. Now, it's much more work and it's not going to look as finished as your commercial ones will, but, but with practice. But with the right design, yeah. that, that style works. It does work. Yeah. Yes, it totally does work. Now, the other kind of um, uh, tear away, and I keep this in a, in a uh, plastic bag because you don't want to get air to it, but there's another kind of stabilizer that you would use for lace, and this is all water-soluble. And it feels like it feels like plastic. Mm -hmm. It feels like a sheet of plastic. And this is what you would you would do standalone lace designs. So and it's those I don't I mean you could do them on your home. This is gonna be advanced if you're doing it without a commercial embroidery machine mm -hmm. um, or a home embroidery machine. Um, but it'll do stand standalone lace. And it, once you're done with it, you wash it in water, and it just melts. It's very gooey. Yeah. It's very funky. It's a little slimy. It's very slimy. That's it. It's slimy. It's totally slimy. Um, but it, I've done some really pretty, um, you try to get all the air out. I've done some really pretty um, ornaments that were like lace ornaments with that. So... You can do it on your home sewing machine. If you do have an embroidery machine, um, my suggestion to you, if you're new to machine embroidery, there is a learning curve. It's just like learning any other thing. And I will suggest to you, 
go out and buy some professionally designed designs before you start buying designs that are off the internet that you haven't seen well. (laughs) Or before you digitize your own stuff, buy some professional ones and practice with some professional ones. Because, and the reason I say that is, and I have other, there's other companies, but Anita Good Design is a really good company, is if you're learning how to digitize um, with digitizing software, there's a lot to it. It's a huge learning curve. And um, if you buy some really good professional designs, they're already done well. Mm-hmm. And um, it's just much easier to start that than to do it the other way. Then after you have after you know kind of what you're doing and how to stabilize stuff, then you can go to some other brands that are on the internet that may not be done as well, or the free download. I'm just steer clear of the free downloads on some of the embroidery designs. At first try. At first try. Yeah. Until you've seen how your machine does, you understand how to stabilize, you understand how to hoop the designs, then you can do the other stuff. But this is, they have tons of cute designs out there. I mean, this is a cute summer one. Shells, flip-flops. You can't go wrong. It's summer. It feels like summer here. I know it's officially still spring, but it's been in the 80s. So Yes, it's been warm here. It counts. I haven't been to the beach in years. Um, the other thing that's cool about embroidery design are in-hoop projects where the entire design is done in the hoop. You can do zipper, um, a little zipper cases all in the hoop. You can do, and they're just cool. So, and of course... You can do all the things that I like to do, which is monograms and that stuff. But I am going to show you here. These were these were the napkins that I embroidered. That I embroidered. How many did I embroider? I don't know. Twenty five. Twenty seven. Twenty seven. I invited a bunch of people over for a birthday party, and I am embroidered these napkins. And this is um, cutaway. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I use cutaway more than I use um, tearaway. Because you can use cutaway on both. And if it's a napkin, nobody's going to. I mean, if they were at my party and decided to criticize that I didn't cut this closer. Seriously? They didn't get invited back for the next no. party. Done. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> so, anyway. But that's, I, I know a lot of people like to do machine embroidery. And I love machine embroidery. I don't do it very much, but when I do, it's usually a monogram of some kind, which I can't believe I don't have that to show you, but... It's on your purse. It is on my purse. I monogram most of my purses. And you know why I monogram some of my purses, really? Is because people are always like, oh, those are so nice. I want one. And they want me to give them that one. And I'm like, but you don't have my na- my monogram, so I can't give it to you. Otherwise, I would be tempted to give it to them. No, I have. I know. I'm weird. So, there you go. What else do you want to know about machine embroidery? Nothing. (laughs) It's not your jam. Well, so, the sewing machine that I have comes with programmed stitches for the alphabet. And so, I could do, like, the little subtle on the cuffs. Or the collar. That was a thing in college. You had yeah. your monogram right there. Yeah. Like on your turtlenecks that you wore under your sweatshirts. Oh, good. <laughs> we totally did. It wasn't just me. Let me just say that that was not exactly the style at Georgia Tech. We were more likely to wear T-shirts. <laughs> you were in the grunge phase. I was in the prep phase. Yeah, we didn't do a lot of monogramming on our flannel. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> True. We did not. I just have not grown out of the monogram. Love it. <laughs> Love monogram. Well, and related, so this pattern, one of the suggestions that we give is, you know, this this particular one is a baby quilt. And so you could embroider the baby's birth date or name inside the little heart. Or if you do the bed size or the larger size and you want to give it as a wedding gift, you could do the date of the wedding in there. And so there's ways to bring embroidery into quilted projects 
without having it overwhelm them. Now, I've seen a lot of beautiful quilts, too, that are just highlighting machine embroidered blocks, too. Oh, exactly. And I will say, if you are going to do that on that quilt, you're going to do it before it's stitched. You may want to stabilize that Yeah, with just a little piece of... And I've seen a good friend of mine, She, when she does applique, and if she's using any kind of satin stitch... If you've done any kind of applique that uses a satin stitch, what you'll see is a lot of times it'll want to tunnel. So that means the stitches on each side are pulling in, which makes the fabric kind of grip together. If you use a stabilizer underneath that satin stitch, it will not do that. Mm -hmm. So anytime you're going to use that kind of, which is really some kind of embroidery, um, that will help prevent that. Yeah. And will look much better. It'll lay flatter. It'll look more professional. But yeah, and a lot of your bigger machines have alphabets, at least and some of them have two or three different alphabets. Yeah, I think mine has a script and uh, just a, a block. block letter. Yeah. Which is essentially machine embroidery, mm -hmm. just at a smaller scale. And some of the specialty stitches on your embroidery or on your sewing machines, those are can be machine embroidery-esque. Mm -hmm. Not probably technically, but... Well, you would use them in lieu of a zigzag around right. an applique shape or something. Yeah. Like if you had, especially if you're doing like printed photographs on fabric, you could have it mimic the idea of a picture frame or a mat right. with some of those Absolutely. fancy stitches. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways that you can use machine embroidery that's not just... And you don't necessarily have to have the embroidery part of that you don't have to they're ex they're a lot they're very expensive mm -hmm. machine embroidery i mean you can buy a regular sewing machine but then the embroidery is always either add-on or the next level up well, with it and if you want to start creating it's your a, own designs you need the software to do it and, and the software is not inexpensive i mean the software is a thousand bucks at least at least the one that i use which is masterworks um is not cheap yeah. So, anyway, but that's machine. I love it. It's a definitely a skill set. Um, as in, there's a learning curve to it. Don't get frustrated. Just remember, ninety percent of the time, if you get frustrated with it, uh, it probably is your stabilizer. Make sure you're using the right stabilizer. And the other thing, oh, the other thing I use with machine embroidery that I don't use any other time is pre pre wound bobbins. And I just use white or black because those stitches don't show on top. So, but why pre-wound instead of winding your own? Um, it for some reason my machine likes them. Number one and two, my mother-in-law got me started on. She goes, "This is just so much easier." And then I can change the one on top, and it doesn't, it doesn't show. I think it's because it's a lighter weight. Mm -hmm. um, it's like a sixty weight, maybe. Yeah, I think so. Actually, I'm still using the one she gave me years ago. <laughs> she gave me, well, she was professional, and she had the, like, professional 14 needle. Hers wasn't that big at the time because she was doing it in the 80s before it was, mm -hmm. you know, but she had a home business. And the table, I kid you not, was half the size of the table we're sitting at. So it was big. So anyway, okay. it was very cool. So, are you a scrappy DIY quilter, or would you rather let the machines do the work? <laughs> you can leave a comment on our blog or the YouTube episode, or in our Facebook group, What's Up Stitches? And that's all we have for this episode. Today's show is made possible by Inmart and QT Fabrics. You can find links to these wonderful companies in the show notes for today's episode. We'd like to thank 77 Peaches and Big Think Productions for helping produce this stitch. If you've enjoyed this show, please like, share, and subscribe. And don't forget to turn on the notifications, which is a bell, on YouTube. Our next virtual stitch-in is Friday, May 10th at 7 p.m. U.S. Eastern, broadcast live on our YouTube channel. And our next book club episode is May 24th. All those details and more can be found on our website, thestitchtvshow.com, along with links to purchase fan gear, quilt patterns like Keys to My Heart, and video classes. Tune in next time for more quilting chat with friends.